Welcome to today's webinar. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Welcome. Welcome to today's webinar. Thank you for joining us today. This webinar will be recorded and available afterwards to re replay. We're excited that um, you've joined us today. If you could keep yourselves on mute throughout the webinar, that would be really helpful. And uh, if you have questions, if you could please put them in the chat and the presenters will um, answer your questions after they present. Today's focus of the webinar is trends in nonprofit academic programs and nonprofit education research global perspectives. We're really excited that we have three amazing facilitators with us today. Roseanne Mirabella at Seton Hall University, Marco Tavani, University of San Francisco, and John Casey, Baruch College, City University of New York. This webinar talks about how the field of nonprofit and philanthropic studies education continues to grow globally. And we'll discuss recent research about nonprofit education from a variety of contexts across the world. So let's get started. And uh, first up is Dr. Mirabella. Thanks, Heather. Welcome, everyone. I wanted to take um, you know, a few minutes today to talk about a project that we've been working on, a group of scholars uh, for many years now, um, trends in nonprofit academic programs and, and education research from a global perspective. As many of you might know, I've, I've done a bit of work on nonprofit management education in the United States. This is the companion piece, if you would, to look at it globally. Um, the world is very big and um, there's a lot of different dimensions to it. So I'm excited to share what we've learned thus far. Next slide, please. The, we're calling this the global census of NGO education and we have certain goals that we're trying to, to meet. So, so the, I, I began this project um, in 2002 after I um, pretty much figured out a lot of where the programs were in the United States, I said to myself, well, let me take a look and see what's going on around the world. And I quickly came to realize that that's really difficult for um, one person to try to figure out how to do. In fact, it's pretty difficult for, you know, 20, 25 people to try to figure out how to do because the programs are very different in the different regions. Obviously the curricular options are different, the histories are different. And so we're looking at education programs for those who have leadership roles in NGOs as managers or social movement leaders or development agency leaders. And I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. Um, an electronic resource was what was launched in 2011, but unlike the MPO database where you can all go out and see all the programs in the United States, this, this is still pretty sloppy. So I consider it a work in progress and um, it's not available yet to the public if you would, but I do share it with researchers. Next slide, please. So basically what we've been doing with this collaboration is since uh, working with Norm Dulch, he was very interested in getting out some of this material uh, to, to researchers, to, to prospective students, to practitioners. And so we started to collaborate with uh, researchers around the world who could write on their particular region of the world. And most of the articles sort of look at what education programs are there in universities. We're looking specifically at programs in colleges and universities. We're not looking at management support programs or other kinds of programs that might be held by nonprofits, for nonprofits. We're really looking at university-based programs. So our first issue was published in uh, 2015 and focused on uh, specific countries. Um, and the the second issue similarly in 2019, um, see the gap there, it does take a lot to, to move this research forward. Um, but we have two issues that are going to come out hopefully in 2021. And, and in 
These issues, um, the first one is still Canada, Denmark, and the United Kingdom, still focused on countries. But the fourth issue that's under review is we actually have formed a collaborative that my colleagues from uh, Southeast Asia have invited me to participate in their collaborative where there are folks from six different countries who, who are exploring nonprofit management education within each of those countries. And they've chosen as a group to use some of the work that Dr. Wish and I did around um, what the, uh, the components of these education programs are, internal and external um, boundary spanning, if you're familiar with some of the work that we've done in that area. And they're looking to see how applicable or not applicable that US based quarter sort of methodology is to that case. And we also have a fifth and sixth issue in progress. Uh, my colleague Marco, who's with us today is, is participating in, in one of those issues writing from um, Western Europe. I'm also writing on Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and I'll talk about that in a second. So next slide, please. So the international census just basically includes the study of education programs for anyone who's uh, looking to be a manager of a nonprofit, an NGO or a development agency. And the methods a little bit vary and they've actually become a little bit more sophisticated as web tools have become more sophisticated. In the beginning when we did this work, it was hunting and pecking on websites to see what we could find out, uh, getting further information from faculty members or admissions offices um, and looking at international databases. My colleague, Mike Taylor at Seton Hall introduced us to a web scraping methodology that we've now used in the Southeast Asia um, uh, journal special issue is almost totally drawing on data that comes from that data scraping where you can take every, um, every .edu and scrape it for several uh, code words, a, a variety of code words, whether that be social entrepreneurship or nonprofit management or nonprofit fund development. And then, then, then it pro pro uh, provides you with a spreadsheet that you can go through and see what of those educational uh, websites that were re returned to you actually had something to do with education programs as opposed to maybe a, a, webinar, a webinar or somebody publishing a book. Next slide, please. And so uh, very quickly, I just wanted to show you what some of the, some of our um, scholarship looks like. So I, I co-wrote uh, with my colleague, Marty Sulik, a piece on Canada. And this just shows you the Canadian landscape of nonprofit post-secondary institutions by region. And so you can see uh, what percentage, you know, obviously Ontario and Quebec have the most um, nonprofit programs in Canada. Um, and it, interestingly enough, they're the English and French speaking. So if you go to the next slide, please, you can see wh what the degrees are. And in a lot of ways, uh, some of them are similar to what we see in other parts of the world where we have a social work diploma, um, a nonprofit management and leadership diploma. Um, but then also similar to what we find in Africa, you find master's degrees in community studies and development, which are the kinds of programs that are looking to educate future managers of development types agencies, which usually are providing um, education for those who will lead nonprofits that deal with indigenous communities, if you would. And so this research showed us uh, how many degrees there were, what type. Now, compared to the US case, there are far fewer nonprofit programs in Canada than there are in the United States. However, as a proportion of universities, there are, there are actually more nonprofit programs in Canada. They just have fewer universities. You know, we have many more universities in the United States. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned previously, we saw a difference in, and this article is now available on, on uh, online first, if you want to take a look at it. We saw a difference between the programs that were being offered in English speaking Canada to um, French speaking Canada. So we actually took it a step further and we compared the databases that we had on liberal regimes around the world and conservative regimes um, around the world, the, the liberal being sort of more, more the Anglophone kinds of, um, uh, countries and the conservative regimes being those in, in parts of Europe, including France and Germany, to compare the um, programs. And you know, just to show you the kinds of research that came out of this, 
using the SB Anderson uh, framework in this regard. And so um, if anybody's interested in that, I'd be more than happy to share the link with you so you can go out and take a look at this paper. Uh, next slide, please. And then what you're looking at right here is, is a, a slide from um, a South Korea's paper, which is the first of the Southeast Asia papers to be published. And this is the kind of thing we could expect from this research. So what this is looking at, so the, the middle um, green uh, space is just showing you the categories that, that um, align with the, the Wish Mirabella categorization that we adopted from Dennis Young and the light greenish line to the right is the United States and the bluish the blue line to the left is is what's happening in South Korea. So what you can tell from this chart are several things. One you can tell that internal management skills are most often um, offered regardless of whether it's South Korea or the United States. You can also see that it's almost kind of equal. But when you look down at fundraising and marketing, you can see that um, fundraising is more likely offered in the United States and less likely offered in South Korea. However, there is another category which you don't see in the United States at all, right? There's no blue line there. And there's a blue line uh, for others. This is because our, my colleagues in South Korea put social entrepreneurship in the other category. And with my research, I put social entrepreneurship as a kind of fundraising, as a kind of way of bringing resources into the organization. We could talk about that. That's sort of an interesting difference. But anyway, this is the kind of research that's coming out um, from, from the work that we're doing in this regard. So next, please. Um, we're just my colleague, um, Ibrahim, a former student of mine, and I are writing on Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. So far, um, we're up to the ends. <laughs> it's a big region of the world. We're hoping to have this in the fifth, uh, fifth edition of NJNAL that comes out. But what we're finding here, and what I found in a previous iteration of this, is that a lot of the, a lot of the teaching around nonprofit management for future NGO or nonprofit leaders is cast within a development framework. And Heather and I are actually writing a piece on this right now for another, uh, for another volume where we're exploring why, uh, why development studies is so strong in some of the uh, Global South universities. Um, next slide, please. And we're taking a critical perspective on this and we're looking at critical development studies. And uh, to just briefly summarize so that we can uh, have time for, for uh, our other presenters to present, the, the, the major issue here is that um, a lot of the education that's taking place in Sub-Saharan Africa, we feel is part and parcel of a continuation of imperialism a continuation of colonialism, if you would, and a continuation of education. I guess the question would be education to serve who? And what we're finding is that education is to serve global capital, if you would, and to, to have the, the universities in Africa um, prepare students to be part of the global economy. And much of what we're seeing uh, with the paper that Heather and I are working on right now, along with Ibrahim, is that Looking at this critically, we're finding that development studies is, is really just a continuation of, of an of a, uh, imperial sense where the Bologna process and other kinds of um, educational frameworks are coming from the north and being imposed on the south. Uh, and if they are not compliant with those, they often risk not getting funding from Northern funders. So more, more to come on that as we, as we continue to write this work and explore critical development studies using critical frames of um, post-colonialism. And um, I think I'll leave it there. I think that was my last slide. And then it, uh, Marco, you take off from here. Thank you, Dr. Rosanne Mirabella, for this uh, wonderful introduction for the <laughs> work you have done for so many years in this uh, panoramic overview of the very diverse uh, landscape that exists uh, in uh, international development. Um, <clears throat> I'm uh, offering here an overview that is, uh, I would say, probably uh, emanating more from my uh, experience as a practitioner in the field. Uh, 
in the global arena where I worked in particular in East Africa, Latin America and Southeast Asia, beside Europe, my, my, my home place, that uh, I've seen uh, some difference and some interesting shifts that happen, you know, within uh, particularly an American perspective that has uh, appeared to have dominated the field of nonprofit management education. But I think it's probably an issue of keywords and an issue of meanings and an issue of interpretation. So I'm very glad to hear that Dr. Rosani is talking about this critical perspective because having worked myself in the field of international development, I also see that the many transformation have already happened uh, in the field, including the shift from uh, international development and humanitarian assistance into social enterprise development and community development for transformation. So this, those perspective, I think, come more from the field and they are more innovative from the field and academia is catching up sometimes to see those things. So um, the next, thank you. Uh, so the, the, what I would like to do is, sorry about the writing that here got messed up, but it's, uh, I, I just want to start with the fact that uh, I, since I'm here in San Francisco and uh, it's considered the birthplace of the United Nations, we should also recognize what our ancestors have done uh, in the past with uh, the idea of including NGOs or, or at, least at that time was really nonprofit organizations, which was a dream of FDR at that time with this idea of uh, uh, creating a new world, right? And uh, what they did is basically they created this, they, gave, they elevated the status of this nonprofit to become consultants at the United Nations system, which is really was phenomenal. And it was really thanks to the contribution of incredible leaders and visionaries at that time, 75 years ago. And that's why it's important for us to know that at the international level, because, and I distinguish international from global, <laughs> because even though many NGOs and nonprofits, they think to be global, we're still surrounded by a very international and national boundaries systems. And all the nonprofits are not recognized outside of their state or national uh, legal boundaries, unless, with the sole exception probably of ECOSOC, the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations, which recognizes some NGOs at this, at this international level which are also not no longer limited to international organization. Now they accept even uh, kind of state and local nonprofits. So that's why this definition of beyond NGOs is important for us because uh, the shift has already happened, happened already 75 years ago. And although the dominance has been more into these international NGOs with this idea of official development assistance, this shift has already happened. And it's much more local, more community-based organizations, and, and is, is really engaged with a lot of international conversations. Next. A, a, a quiz that I do often to my students uh, in, uh, in nonprofits, I said, you know, what is the largest NGO? You know, they often say, well, the Bill and Melinda Gates, you know, obviously because of the money, they, the endowment that they do, and unlike other foundations, they actually spend their money, thank God. But you know, obviously you want to refer to others, like BRAC is considered the larger NGO in terms of number of employees. And it's an organization that many people don't know. It's in Bangladesh, you know, similar to the Grameen Bank. They do a lot of social enterprises. They're really revolutionary in their way that they approach the, the well-being of people in many aspects. And they're all over the world, right? So it's not just no longer in Bangladesh, they're all over the world. So again, depends what the perspective you're doing, right? Is you're considering the money or, or, or you're considering other aspects of these organizations. Next. Another interesting quiz or question regarding the legal structure of this organization. That's why the definition sometimes of capturing those organizations, even in the study of Dr. Mirabella is very difficult because who, who are you talking about? You know, who are those, those, uh, uh, those organizations? And an example is actually uh, the, the the structure of, of, of the IC, ICRC, the International Committee for the Red Cross. What is it? Is it a nonprofit? Is it an NGO? Is it an IGO, an intergovernmental organization? Is all of the above and none of the above? Because <laughs> it's actually registered as a nonprofit in Switzerland, but has guarantee and particular you know benefits uh, of working at the international level, as we know particularly in conflict zones uh, through the Geneva Convention that gives a different privileges. So we need to think beyond what we call in the United States 501c3s. We said that there are even 30 
over 35 denomination of typology of nonprofit, even according to the IRS, is much more complex and diverse the definitions even in the United States. At the international level, is even more because those structure takes different shape and different aspects and different perspectives. And that's what is important uh, to look at the legal compositions. For example, in Italy, uh, in my country, you know, we talk about uh, the equivalent of 501c3 will be onlus, which is an organization uh, with nonprofit as a primary objective with uh, social utility. That's what it means. And is a particular denomination and is organized and ministered by the Ministry of Interior because they do service through contract to government to the large majority, not through philanthropy. But they have a system also of receiving funds through a direct taxation system in which the citizen, they identify a particular nonprofit for the five per thousand income of that, which is a system that many other countries do not have. So we don't have to recur to philanthropic and fundraising effort because we have an embedded system to the taxation. But NGOs, which are also considered as on loose, those who do uh, work at the, uh, in other countries, they are actually administered by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs because they are in this work of what we call as cooperation. So this is just an example, but you know, I know in the context in Kenya, for example, is, is very similar to this and is in the process of transformation of those legal entities that classify these nonprofits. Next. One important aspect that unfortunately nobody is paying attention to it, or at least very few people to it, but to me is very revolutionary is finally the classification of this so-called uh, organization, you know, what, uh, what we used to call in Europe, the third sector to distinguish from the nonprofit sector has finally come into a very specific way of creating an, a system of accounting. Who are, who are in, who are out? Uh, our colleague Lester Salomon for more than 30 years has been adamant in pushing this idea of nonprofit institution, NPIs. But finally, after the reform that was suggested in 2008 by the United Nations system of accounting, finally in 2018, there has been a publication that you see here, the satellite account, that finally recognized as a system of classifying who should be considered in this wider umbrella, this bigger tent, if you will, that is no longer the nonprofit institution, but also the TSE. The TSEs are the third sector social economy. And those includes also social enterprise, but not all social enterprise. That's what is particularly important and revolutionary because especially in the United States, uh, people you know, talk about social enterprises, especially from a business perspective, but that's not necessarily what we are talking about unless there is a clear pri priorities on the mission and, and less uh, on, uh, on, uh, on profit. The profit is limited in the redist redistribution and is defining this dog. So I invite everyone to look at this because already in Latin America and Europe, those shifts have already happened. I've, I always consult in Latin America with other universities that they are talking about the a social economy and solidarity economy. Next. And then the context matter, you know, I, I started my work in academia after coming from, uh, from a field at DePaul University after doing a work on leadership and they asked me, you know, can you do more work on, uh, on international NGOs or, or at least uh, in the international uh, nonprofit fields? And I remember at that time, they couldn't really understand those things. They had, uh, you know, a, a joint degree between international studies who were offering some framework kind of soft skills. And then our school of public service was offering hard skills in, in management. But there was not really a emerged elements. There was not really an understanding of what is the specific fields and specific skills and mindsets that are required. And I remember that I started the program also on refugees, because many of our students, they were working on so-called VOLAG, the volunteer agencies, those who are classified by, <clears throat> um, by you know, doing the work for in, on behalf of our government on resettlement. But they couldn't understand what was the international field. In other words, what is, what is beyond or behind 
this, this uh, resettlement stage in the United States? What is the refugee work that is happening at UNHCR level, et cetera? So a program I started even at, at USF, University of San Francisco, is this one on understanding refugee service management, which really tap into these international dimensions of NGOs. And, they, and, and that's, that's where they understand what really happened be, before you become a refugees and, and, and the agency that they're working with them. So in conclusion, you know, I, I think it's important to think more, not only globally, but also internationally. And, uh, you know, in our program here, at University of San Francisco, we have embedded uh, this international aspect in every aspect of the curriculum. When I came in here about seven years ago, because of my background in international nonprofits, they said, oh, can you do a course on NGO? <laughs> you know, that's the classic approach. Like we often say, oh, leadership, let's talk about women leadership. No, let's talk about something that is everything is about international. So we embedded everything in, in, in every course aspect of internationalizations because we are international. Many of our students end up to work in different contexts, in different situations, and they need to have a framework. We actually had cases of uh, people working in our uh, nonprofits in San Francisco getting in trouble in, in uh, Egypt, you know, during uh, the so-called uh, Arab Spring because they didn't have the legal permission to doing that, for doing that. We had other experiences of uh, people operating at the international level, but not understanding the limitations of your own uh, um, different international uh, experience, etc. So we work also on the sustainable development goals as a framework that uh, unites across, uh, um, you know, uh, sectors. And, uh, and that's, I think it's, it's important for us as educators to think about the future, uh, which is much more international and much more global than what we tend to think in our local communities that are often already globalized. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the danger always of going last is that your two colleagues before you have already said everything you wanted to say. So there's a little bit of an aspect of that. I guess I, what I'll do is, uh, and what I'm, you know, my role here is bringing it down to look at my personal teaching and how kind of I address these issues of the global dimensions. And, and my, my talk now is uh, very much based on, on my book, The, non the Nonprofit World. Uh, the next slide. So uh, like Marco, and, and as Marco just said, you know, uh, uh, what we tend to do is corral teaching about uh, international issues into a course. Um, I, like Marco, would say that in a globalised world, every student of the nonprofit sector must understand how it operates in different countries and in the international arena. You know, our, our students, our graduates will go work around the world. Uh, some may work in international organisations or students, even those who stay domestically, will undoubtedly come in contact with colleagues uh, from around the world with different perspectives. Or they may work um, in their local community with immigrant communities and the people who come to the United States with a whole different understanding of uh, non-profit organizations. So it's, it's really important that our students, all our students get a, a real understanding. Next slide. So the way I look at it is that we have three key perspectives. The comparative perspective, which we've been looking at uh, and, and focusing on a lot. So looking at the difference between the national non-profit sectors or the non-profit sectors, how it operates in different countries around the world. We have to talk about, second, the globalization perspective on how does, you know, the cross-border dynamics affect almost every organization, even the, the you know, the most, the many of whom think of themselves as domestic organizations, but find, in fact, there's some sort of pressure to, to internationalize, globalize uh, their work. So it's important that people understand that. And finally, the international perspective that focuses on the expanding role of international nonprofits, whether it's in global dialogues, in governance, or in service delivery, those volags that uh, Marco was talking about. So what I'm going to do in the minutes I have is give you some vignettes of 
um, of those three perspectives to give you a sense of uh, what, what I teach about in, in those three areas. Uh, next slide. But first, we have to talk about the nomenclature, the vocabulary, the sorts of things that uh, you know both uh, Roseanne and Marco were talking about when you're looking around the world. This is the slide I present to my students on the first day of class, on any class I teach about nonprofits, to say that look, these are the words you are going to have to understand. Um, if you're going to work in the nonprofit sector, certainly even within the United States, but certainly outside the United States. So all of these are words which are used. They may have different meanings. They may come from different backgrounds. Um, but ultimately, in some ways, it's just, uh, you know, fashion preferences in, in different contexts. You know, even if we look um, at our, our friends to the north, you know, in Canada, and I don't know if there's anybody from Canada on this uh, call but you know they tend to word, use the word charity and voluntary much more than we do here in the United States and these are only the words in English if we then go into other languages um, we get even more complicated and again the case of Canada in Francophone Canada they tend to use the word uh, bele, bele, uh, organizations benevolent. I don't. I don't speak French, so I can't exactly pronounce it properly. But they talk about benevolent organizations and benevolence uh, as an operating con concept when they, they work in French. And you have to understand how all of these concepts work differently in different countries. So you know, in English-speaking countries, we tend to think of uh, foundations more as grant-giving organizations, where in many European countries, they're in fact operating foundations foundations, which work very similarly to other service delivery organizations. Next slide. So on one hand, we have to talk about the vocabulary. On the other hand, we have to talk about disciplines. And actually, this is where I need to cross check my work with the work uh, Roseanne has been doing at looking at what's happening in different organizations uh, or different teaching programs around the world. In the USA and other English speaking democracies, common law countries generally, you know, we have a lot of standalone nonprofit or philanthropy education programs, or if they're embedded in wider schools, they're either in public administration, business studies, or social work, right? However, if you go outside our world, the English speaking uh, democracies, you'll find that in fact, programs are embedded more in political science, in sociology, in economics, and even in public law. The other hand, it's different consequences, different perspectives on how they look at the education in our area and what terminology they'll use. And, and you know, I actually have to go back and look closely at uh, Roseanne's work and see how that kind of coincides with some of the ideas about uh, the programs they, they look at. So let's look, first of all, at comparative. So the next slide. So those of you who want more information about the sorts of things, particularly that Marco has been talking about, but also Roseanne talked about, about how it operates in different countries, you'll be pleased to know that there are a lot of uh, very good uh, comparative programs. Uh, Marco mentioned the, the what I have there is the second one, the UN Statistics the, the Division and its third or Social Economy Sector Handbook. But there's a whole list here and I'll put these all up in the chat room. I, I won't go through them. Uh, but what you'll uh, be pleased to know is uh, that there are in fact many good programs which you can use to look at comparative. Um, and what's interesting is increasingly, you know, if you get uh, uh, emails from academia or from ResearchGate, you'll see that increasingly, if you put the right keywords there, you'll get lots of reports. In fact, just this morning, I got an email from academia about a report on civil society in Zanzibar. Uh, you know, choose any of the keywords you want, choose any country you want, and there's a lot of great material out there. Next slide. And it all ends up coming down to some version of these different models of the nonprofit sector. Uh, Roseanne, I think, mentioned Esping Anderson's work and the comparative work. Uh, Lester Salomon and uh, Helmut Anheyer have done some work, and I've got my own version of it. This is from my book, uh, The Nonprofit World. So, you know, you look at different models of how. Uh, society, welfare state, capitalism, authoritarian states operates, and you'll find that within that, um, the nonprofit sector works very differently, um, and it's incumbent on us to kind of understand it and, and teach it to our students. Next slide. 
Next is the globalization perspective. You know, let's try and understand how organizations, nonprofit organizations around the world are increasingly globalizing. And we don't really need to go further than our own organization. I'd say most of the people uh, on this call are members of NAC, the Nonprofit Academic Centers Council, or certainly members of NASPA, um, the, uh, interestingly enough, now called the Network of Schools of Public Affairs and Administration. It used to be called the National Association, focusing very much on the United States and Canada. And then sometime about eight, 10 years ago, started getting applications for membership and for accreditation from uh, public administration programs around the world and thought, mm, we better globalize, we'll, we'll change our name from National Association to Network, put in the new code, the global standard in public affairs education, um, and move that way. And NAC, the Nonprofit Academic Centers Council, is also receiving increasing number of inquiries about membership, about participation um, from around the world. In fact, what was it last year? My memory is going on these things. Um, no, it would have been the year before. Um, NAC held its first ever conference outside the United States. Um, in, in London uh, as a sign of its uh, globalization. And that's happening with so many organizations and it's a dynamic that we all need to understand about how it affects our organization and how it affects in the, the, uh, nonprofit organizations in, in the United States as they kind of, they look to work uh, across borders and with people from other borders, even if it's only to enter an international coalition of organizations and international network of organizations that work in similar fields. What's the dialogue going to be between those sorts of organizations? Next slide. Then of course, now the international perspective. So we should all know about the huge rise in the number of international NGOs. This is the figure from the uh, Union of International Associations their uh, census of INGOs. They only work with the most prominent quote unquote organizations and you know their, their list uh, what about 2010 was up to about 30,000. I don't know how many of you were uh, familiar with the bridge project which attempted to assign a unique identifier to every nonprofit in the world. They got up to 3 million nonprofit organizations before unfortunately and sadly the project collapsed in uh, August of last year. Uh, they could no longer find funding, they could no longer support, so they closed the project down. But if you look up bridge.org, you'll see their, their web page is up there, but uh, they're no longer. So, you know, the number of international nonprofit organizations we can uh, confidently estimate is somewhere between. Uh, 30,000 and 3 million. So that's a pretty confident estimate of the, the, the number of uh, international non government organizations. Uh, next slide. But the focus tends to be when we talk about NGOs, international nonprofits, the focus tends to be very much on aid, development, human rights, environmental organizations. So, you know, uh, you know whether it's Greenpeace, Amnesty International, um, those sorts of organizations. But we have to remember there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of international nonprofit organizations. And the probably the one that has the most impact on the everyday life of every person in the world is the international standard organization. It's called the International Organization for Standards. It uses ISO as its name. It's not exactly an acronym. It's more, it's a short name so that, that people easily identify it. Everybody, at this seminar is sitting in a room surrounded by dozens of objects built to ISO standards, right? Um, this is the standard setting organization uh, for the, the whole world. And many of you probably teach the ISO 9000 series of managerial uh, and leadership standards for organizations. So it's an independent non-government organization made up of members of the national standards bodies of 165 countries. So, you know, in my teaching, I emphasize this a lot. I, you know, I emphasize things like the International Quilters Association. I emphasize the International Window Film Association, a professional association of those people who put up plastic films on windows uh, around the world. And certainly, you know, different sports, cultural organizations, 
and, and the, the role they play. So very much emphasizing those sorts of organizations. Next slide. And finally, I want to do, you know, give a shout out to NAC, the Nonprofit Academic Centres Council. You know, they have curricular guidelines for graduate programs. Um, these two uh, guidelines, the, the, these first two guidelines focus, you know, a, a lot on international and global and transnational issues and then sprinkled throughout the rest of the guidelines, there's a lot of work. You know, NAC is going through a process of updating the guidelines. Marco and I and other people are working with them to, to look at what can be even strengthened more um, in the international global perspective, but there's already a lot of material there. Uh, next slide, final slide. So the references to this are one, my book, <laughs> uh, the, the nonprofit world looking at issues around the world, but also this talk and the written version of this talk is uh, in fact the draft of a uh, chapter I'm, I'm putting together for Will Brown and Matt Hale's a new handbook on preparing leaders for a nonprofit organizations. So there's a link there. I don't know if you can pick it up. Certainly anybody who e emails me, I'm quite happy to uh, send you a draft and I'll, uh, I'd appreciate any feedback on that. Okay, that's all I had to say. Thank you very much. Uh, we had just had three excellent pr presentations, nonprofit education and global perspectives. Thank you so much for your time. We now have about 20 minutes left uh, for open discussion and Q&A. So um, well, I'll open it up to everyone to be able to, to have that discussion. Does anyone have any questions? Comments? Yes, Marco. I, I actually do have a comment. And first of all, I'm very grateful for my colleagues uh, uh, John and Roseanne for giving this perspective that is both very, you know, internationally driven and, and global. Particularly with the aspect that uh, came out from Roseanne's presentation, I think is very important. It has to do with this critical perspective, you know, because uh, uh, we, we, we often, uh, you know, I remember when I came at DePaul University, when I told you that they asked me to develop this program, this international public service program, which by the way, is the first not, not MPA, MPP program on nonprofits international uh, accredited by NASPA. You know, they don't, they don't show off too much, but it was accredited in 2007, which is also significant. But the problem is that when I came in, they had a course and the course was uh, focused on Northern NGOs and Southern NGOs. This denomination, even though we have kind of, and then they call it like third world development, stuff like this. I mean, those words are so loaded <laughs> into this kind of a colonial or neo-colonial approach that uh, we need to study that first of all, because unfortunately there are new dynamics of international development, which is not on the nonprofit side, but is on the FDI side, foreign direct investment side. Of from China and other big players in Africa in particular, that we need to know about those lessons, but in a critical way. And I think what you, you guys are doing, I think is very important and for all of us to retake this critical approach because unfortunately those dynamics still exist uh, in our communities and in certainly international. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, Marco. I. I... I think that um, one of the things that that we're looking at is how the imposition and you know John raised the, the standards the I, IOS well uh, ISO we 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 have our standards as well right the the nonprofit academic center councils guidelines are standards right NASPA has standards um, and all of these standards impose frames on on uh, global folks whether or not the frames match what where they are culturally where they are um in in terms of of what they want to see happen in their local communities and and so the work that heather and i are doing right now with 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 um, ibrahim is really focused on um trying to unravel at the the impact that for example the bologna process has had in institutions on sub-saharan africa uh, the brain drain that has happened as a result of those sorts of initiatives. Um, and again, all couched within this sort of 
we're, we're Northern, we know, you're Southern, you don't know, um, and, and completely disregarding indigenous knowledge and that there was indigenous knowledge that was there before colonization, right? So it's a lot to, it's a lot to unravel and study, um, but, but thank you for that because that's sort of what we're, what we're trying to explore with this work that we're doing. Could I ask a question? Yeah, it's Paul here. Hello, um, you mentioned Rosanna. You mentioned standards or whatever, uh, and I totally concur with everything you said. But you might also go back to Marco uh, and others of the panel. Um, there's an argument. There's a counter argument that says that standards, rather than raise, actually depress. In other words, that you it takes exactly to your point where you've got a standard. If you like, join upon the tragedy of the Commons argument that actually what you can sometimes do with standards is rather than raise people, you actually push down and exclude what could be brilliant uh, individual country standards. And I was wondering if people agree with that, and if they do, how we overcome that? Not that I will quickly add the NAT guidelines do that. Don't do that. <laughs> well, for example, let me just throw out the NASPA guidelines, this network, right? And so when we were developing, when they wanted to to do standards for nonprofits, we wanted to put the word democracy in. And they didn't want to include the word democracy because, because then it wouldn't be applicable in authoritarian countries that are not democratic. So then we had this whole conversation about what's the point? <laughs> you know, what what are, you know, you go back to what are nonprofits, what is civil society, what 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 are these organizations? How do you have that conversation, right? I don't know. I throw that out to all of you because it's 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 out there, and this was a NASPA this was a NASPA focus that they didn't want to include words around democracy that would have institutions in China, for example, not want to join NASPA. Yeah. Uh, just to follow up on this question, very good question, Paul. Uh, I yes, certainly the, the the controversy and the kind of tension exists out there, and that's good. That's a good tension. But I think uh, I, I work mostly in, within the UN realm, and I think uh, the processes are usually starting with the sets of principles, because we're very diverse. We are very we have, we come from very different point of views. So to have some, for example, right now I'm working with uh, Chinese companies and, and, and Chinese government representative on this process for conflict uh, minerals. As we know, in the, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, actually, there is a lot of NGOs that are actively involved in this. And, and, and China has responded with guidelines that are kind of at the CSR level. And, and I and other colleagues are arguing that that's not enough. <laughs> the CSR things are good, but not enough. The standards need to be also regulated at the intergovernmental level with multiple players across sectors, including NGOs, we do have a voice with that. It's a very complex situation with the strong interests and with the highly, you know, more than 150 militias active out there. You know, our um, ambassador from Italy just got killed last week in those regions because of that. I mean, those, those are serious issues that undermine the safety and security of many of the NGO workers around the world. So it has to be, yeah, the standards, you know, often they're referring to the kind of, uh, you know, whatever association, organizations, et cetera. But in some cases at the international level, we need to operate more also with the intergovernmental level. That's why we say it's not just a nonprofit, it's a non-governmental. And the distinction is not just casually done. It's because the government, a separation, the independence is very important to guarantee that uh, values that civil society represents. Related to some of these observations, I was a little surprised, uh, John, this was in your slide about where these um, programs are and what disciplines, and of course, Roseanne, this is directly tied to your work, but the US using, you know, administration and management and those kind of more technical fields. And I always like to think, well, we own, you know, the, the democracy, the advocacy um, role for nonprofits, but the rest of the world, and I was I'm assuming, John, this was beyond just the English speaking world um, countries, but poli sci, sociology, econ, public law, you know, much more related to that advocacy role, actually. 
So if any, any of you who've studied this more want to elaborate a little bit more on that, I find it really interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, exactly. So, you know, where is the focus and what's the focus of the, the interest in these kind of non-state, non-governmental organizations? So first of all, if you're, you're working within contexts where there are much more state dominant in terms of service provision or whatever, so the organizations are working from outside. My, my own doctorate, I did my doctorate in Spain. Um, it's from a department of uh, political science and public law. So that's why I did it. And, and so, one, one, you know, first of all, which departments are they in? But also, are they within even the academy as we understand it, right? So a lot of the uh, education of the nonprofit sector and the management and the political work of the nonprofit sector comes from the sector itself, associations within the sector itself. Because you know most of the the you know public administration studies is still focus very much on the government provision of services. So as the nonprofit sector is growing, and I'll use the example of Spain. Within Spain, it's the the associations of nonprofit organisations that have taken on very much the discussion, the analysis, and the education about the sector, which has not really moved that much in, into universities. I mean, I was one of the first person to do a doctoral thesis to do with uh, nonprofit issues. In, in fact, I was surprised uh, only a couple of years ago when somebody was talking about the history of nonprofit studies um, in Spain. And the, the, you know, they actually identified my, my doctoral thesis as one of the first doctoral thesis. And this is not 1999, the first doc, one of the first doctoral thesis that, that focused on nonprofit organizations. And so, uh, Roseanne, if we can follow that up, I'd be, I mean, I must admit, you know, I, I have looked at your, your website, but I kind of haven't analysed those articles you cited. I mean, how much are you finding kind of outside the area of, uh, you know, business, social work, particularly, I mean, you know, as you go in and it's the sorts of uh, uh, focus uh, that, you know, Jeannie just spoke about spoke about those people who are more interested in the, the political aspects, the social movement aspects of it, or, or the sorts of thing Marco was talking about, the social economy aspects of it. Right, and, and, and absolutely, John, and I think that we have to be open to, to including those kinds of programs as part of us, right? Because we've, you know, I fault my own work uh, so much now because the focus on nonprofit management made us look at how are we teaching people to run organizations? And that seemed to be our, our, our reason for existence, right? But, but when we think about the, the times that we're living in, we, we, I, th I think we wanna also be educating our students around social movements and advocacy and social change around some of the wicked problems, right? And we're not giving them the tools and the skills that they need to do that if we're focused in focusing them on teaching how to run organizations, because that's at, but but so the, there's a push and a pull here, right? So the the push is the more the more uh, everything becomes about the dollar and everything becomes about you know capitalism, the less the less inclined these programs are to focus on social change, social movements, and issues of power. You know, we're almost told don't talk about power with your students, right? Because then we become a threat. So that's this whole sort of neoliberal capture that they have of us, if you would. And so when I went to, to do this work in South Africa, I found nothing on nonprofit or NGOs, but the minute you put the word development in, you just find all these programs. Why? Because the, 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 it came from the North. It came from, it came from Europe, Europe requiring uh, in order for for them to get grants from northern foundations, in order for them to to participate in the Bologna process, um, uh, in order for them to have their local not NGOs, they had to participate because of the Washington Consensus and the International Monetary Fund and all these other kinds of things. So once you start to use the lens of power, you're now having very different conversations. But it's also it's also a, it's threatening, but B, it also, it also makes us look at what we do. And then the last thing I'll say on this is I fault many of our colleagues who, who take what we know from 
Anglophone countries and go to these other parts of the world and say, here's how you teach nonprofit education. Really, what works in what works in the United States or the UK is going to work in, in Southeast Asia. I, I, I don't I don't I question that. I question that. Although if I can say one of the complications here, one of the fascinating things is, of course, kind of globalization and the spread of ideas comes from people moving around. So I'm always intrigued that some of the people I meet uh, who teach in this field in non-Anglophone countries or around the world have studied in the United States. Right. Sometimes right. they've you know, got a master's or a doctorate from a US university and then they go back home and in their suitcase, they, they have the model of what we teach and in fact, interpret it for their own circumstances, but it's still very much based in, in our model. Yeah. I think also the, we also live and operate uh, in a bubble. And mm -hmm. I'm not saying just because I'm from Silicon Valley, San Francisco, but in the high tech, which is another bubble within the bubble. Mm -hmm. But also United States with this model of philanthropy, with the tax exempt system that we have created along this centuries or so, have created a model that we assume that that's what philanthropy is, that's what nonprofit is. And the reality of the diversity of the world that this is a scenario that is much more complex and much more, much deeper than that. And, uh, and in my work, particularly on civil society around the world, I discovered also some contradiction. That's why it's important to go back to what I was explaining before about the definitions, the legal definition, the classification. Otherwise, we speak apples and oranges. For example, I have I worked with the civil society organizations in Mexico. This part of a counterinsurgency war warfare that they actually they are, they are terrorist groups. And you might remember the comment a few years ago of uh, former President Bill Clinton saying that Al Qaeda was a regional NGO, and everybody said, oh, I "Don't call it NGO." So, I mean, the, all this, and I like the list that, uh, you know, uh, Dr. John Casey was giving us, you know, the idea of uh, Gongo, government organized, uh, you know, NGOs, or Congo, co corporate organized NGOs, or Quango, quasi organized. Those are important because these kind of uh, hybrids and sometimes uh, creates also the, 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 the kind of conflict uh, within those classifications, and they are used for either directing our communities toward the better well-being, which we all aspire to, or directing toward the more reimagined dynamics of neocolonialism or, or dependency and oppression. So that's why those frameworks, the soft skills frameworks are so important along the hard skill frameworks for and skills for or running organizations. And that's what NAC, NAC has been about, you know, like providing those interrelated uh, competencies for our students. One thing that I hadn't mentioned, if I could just say quickly, Heather, we're hoping that after after many of these uh, special issues of JNEL are out there to have a summit where we can bring all of these authors together to have conversations like we're having here today comparatively, but then also talking about what, what should be, if you would, as opposed to what is. Um, and so uh, be looking for that. We're hoping to do that in 2022, um, you know, to have those conversations. But I think that's important to then bring all of the, all of the authors together to, to talk about what we found um, and, and how we move forward. Thank you so much uh, for the discussion today. We really appreciate the presenters and their time. And thank you for all the attendees. Uh, the next webinar will be happening on April 7th from 12 to 1 Eastern. The focus will be on curriculum planning, implementation and program assessment. I actually will be facilitating that webinar along with Erin Nelson from the University of Memphis. So if you're interested in the topic of, of program assessment or curriculum management and development, come attend that webinar. So thank you for your time and hopefully see you next month. Thanks everyone. <laughs>